there's basically three ways that games can help you learn. And there's one principle that comes up over and over and over again for improving how well games teach something. So we're gonna talk about those three ways, and at the end of the video, I'm gonna get into this key principle that I think uh, applies pretty much across the, the board to games of all kinds. The first way is that games make things more fun, right? So the first way is just to motivate people to do something that is going to teach them something. And you see this in the wildly popular classroom app called Kahoot. Now, if you're not familiar with Kahoot, basically it's a way of answering questions and you get points for answering questions. In a classroom, you might divide the class into two groups and one group is answering the same questions as another group. And then whichever group answers more questions correctly, they win the game. Now in this kind of setup, the basic task remains the same, right? Students are just answering questions that a teacher might ask anyhow, just as like a random question that you might ask a student during a class discussion. But in this setting, the students are getting points for answering that question correctly. And so uh, it's the points and the kind of competition aspect that make the learning process more fun. So people are going to spend more time with it. They're going to be happier playing Kahoot rather than just answering questions all by themselves. It's a good app. I, I don't know what else to say about it. But adding points and leaderboards and badges, this isn't the only way to make something more fun. Let's look at another app real quick. This is an app that I downloaded a little while ago. It's called Math Jump. It's not a very sophisticated app. Basically, the idea is that you solve arithmetic problems quickly and correctly, um, or your character dies. So you have a little character, it's running along these different paths, and then as long as you keep solving problems, it'll jump at the right time. If you're just solving equations on a piece of paper, people find that boring, but if you're watching this little character, you know, jump and where you you have some responsibility to this character to keep it alive, you're, you're kind of adding this gamifying element to make it more fun. But there's another example, and maybe a better example of this approach, is a game called Was It Trouble. It's also a math learning game. And basically the idea is that you are trying to free these little cute animals called Wuzzits from their prison. I guess they've been in prison somehow. And uh, to do this, you have to solve these little puzzles that involve different kinds of gears. You've got some game elements here that are similar to points, which are the gems and I think the stars that you get from solving problems correctly. But then you're also freeing these little characters, so there's a little bit of a storyline. But they've added another element to make it fun as well, which is the cast of the problem. They've recast the task into something different. Was It Trouble focuses on teaching linear equations and solving linear equations. And actually that is what students do. They solve linear equations in the app, but they might not even realize they're solving linear equations because it's presented in a very different way than they would be presented in a classroom context. More on was it trouble a little bit later. So first way, first way the games help, they can make things more fun. Interesting, but not earth shattering. Now the second way is that games can directly teach concepts or skills. There's a few different ways of doing this. So I wanna walk through some examples so that you can see how different games accomplish this. But before we get to that, it's important to recognize that every game teaches you something. And that includes both concepts and skills. For instance, when we play Mario, we get better at things like jumping at the right time, at avoiding enemies, at collecting coins, right? These are all skills that Mario players will get better at over time. And we also gain knowledge from playing Mario. What do these different kinds of mushrooms do or mean? How does a red shell turtle differ from a green shell turtle? The bigger question isn't whether we're learning something, but it's what we are learning. If you spend 100 hours playing Mario, you're going to get pretty darn good at playing Mario and jumping at the right time and collecting all the coins and finding the secret levels and all these things. But 
all those skills and that knowledge that you gain from playing Mario is not necessarily going to be relevant outside of the Mario game. So if the skills that you learn are not relevant outside of the game, then usually that's not the kind of learning that we're interested in. When we're, when we're talking about game-based learning, we're usually talking about a game that is helping us learn a skill that is outside of the game itself. Let's look at some examples. Strategy games like Go and Chess have been used for a long time to think about strategic thinking outside of those games. So for instance, there is a proverb in Go that says, um, attack from strength. So if you attack with a weak group, that's a bad thing because you're liable to get counterattacked very easily. Or the idea that you need to take more risks when you are behind, uh, you might learn that in a game, but then apply that to a military setting or maybe a business setting or something like this. With strategy games and some other games, what we're thinking about is kind of using the game as an analogy for some other uh, domain that we're interested in. But let's look at another example here. In World War II, the US military developed these uh, airplane spotter cards for civilian volunteers. As people played their normal card games, as people played poker or spades or hearts or whatever, they would be using cards that had Axis planes and Ally planes on them so that, you know, if, I don't know, some German plane came flying over the American countryside, uh, they would they would be able to recognize that plane and report that plane to the military or the government. In this kind of scenario, in this kind of setting, the game mechanics don't really have anything to do with the learning. You're just going to play the game that you play, and you know the learning, the supposed learning that's going on here, which is you getting familiar with different airplanes and air types. That's kind of just tacked on to the side. With a strategy game like chess, you invent the game, and then it's up to the players to figure out how to apply principles of the game outside of chess. With the plain spotter cards, the learning is bolted on after the fact. It's kind of just a little addendum to help people learn something while they're playing the game. But there is another whole way of designing games for learning, and that is to think about the learning goal first, and then design the game around that learning goal so that the mechanics of the game, the actual decisions that you make and the moves that you play as you play the game, those are also learning events. Like the game and the learning are intimately connected. This game, for instance, it's called Coding Ocean. And it is, it is a game designed to teach students how to program. They have a little map here. You have a little ship. These cards are commands for your ship to go. And so basically you have to solve these little problems where you lay out cards uh, to direct your ship to go to certain things or accomplish certain tasks, find treasure, avoid whirlpools and this kind of thing. As the levels increase, the game introduces things like conditions and loops and uh, recursion. In essence, the students are writing programs as they play the game. So this is an example of a game where the mechanics and the learning goals are kind of intimately connected. Another example is a game like Dragon Box. The specific game that I'm talking about here is called Dragon Box Numbers, but they have a whole suite of different games for uh, teaching math to young kids. And the idea here is to get students familiar with numbers and, and kind of develop early numeracy in kids. To do this, they've built visualizations of the numbers with like sounds and these little monsters. And students have to do various manipulations and build shapes with it. They get money, which they have to spend. And of course the money is another repre number, numerical representation. And so students get better at say paying for the things with the money they develop. And so the whole idea behind uh, the Dragon Box suite of games, is that the learning goal comes first. They decide on what the learning goal is, and then they develop mechanics around that game. I have to take a little bit of an aside here, because a lot of researchers and developers, they use the terms gamification and game-based learning in uh, two different ways. So gamification is kind of like the games I was talking about in the first part of this video, Kahoot for example, is an example of gamification. Game-based learning is more like these examples that I'm talking about now, where the game mechanics are intimately connected to the learning goals, and they are developed around those learning goals. So 
uh, Coding Ocean that I just mentioned, and Dragon Box. <laughs> the other one that I just mentioned literally 30 seconds ago. So if you ever run into someone that's like, that's not game-based learning, that's gamification, you know, now you, you know why they're saying that. But there's another way that games can help you learn, which I haven't even gotten to yet, and that is that games can prepare students for future learning. What I mean by that is that the game doesn't really directly teach you anything, but what happens is that, to, to use a metaphor here, the game tills the field or plows the field of the brain so that later on when you do get that lecture or that information or you read that chapter, you understand more deeply of what's, uh, of what's happening because you're kind of prepped, you're prepared to understand that information. So let's look at a few examples of this approach. This is Space Invaders, which is an old game that I played for many hours as a kid. And this is a screenshot from Stats Invaders. Now, Stats Invaders was basically inspired by Space Invaders, but it was designed as a preparation for future learning experience. So the way it works is that alien ships drop down from the top of the screen and you're on the bottom of the screen and you're trying to like pew 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 you're trying to uh destroy these alien ships because i i think the aliens are trying to destroy you i don't think they're friendly aliens and in the game you have to decide what distribution matches the way that the aliens have been coming down so if a bunch of aliens are just coming down like straight down straight down all the time and only a few are coming in on the side maybe that's a normal distribution. Or if you have a binomial distribution, that's the one with two humps on the side, um, maybe you get a lot of aliens coming down here, but not as many on the outside. This game is not really meant to teach something on its own, but what it's meant to do is be paired with instruction on basic statistics. So uh, mean, standard deviation, uh, different kinds of distributions. And the research on this shows that, yeah, hey, this game does help. It does get students more familiar with the basic concepts so that when they do read more about standard deviation or listen to a lecture on standard deviation, they get a lot more out of that lecture. So there's a researcher who basically did a whole dissertation on how to use commercial video games as preparation for future learning experiences. The games that he used were Call of Duty and Civilization. The basic idea was the same as Stats Invaders. You have students play these games initially for a number of hours and then they hear a lecture on the material. So they play Call of Duty which has to do with World War II and then they hear a lecture on certain certain aspects of World War II or maybe World War II battles. The students here they don't get anything out of playing the game directly. If you give them a test on the history of World War II after they played the uh, Call of Duty, they're not going to magically know stuff about World War II. What happens is that a group of students who plays Call of Duty first before getting that lecture, they end up getting a lot more out of that lecture than a group of students who has not had that preparatory experience beforehand. I have an old video about preparation for future learning. I'll put that in a link at the top of the video, and I'll also put that in a link in the description. Before we get to this key principle that I referenced in the beginning, I want to be clear that uh, it's not like a single game falls into one of these categories. A game can leverage all three of these approaches. For instance, Was It Trouble? It uses gems and it uses kind of gamified elements to make the play more fun. That's one thing. It also is focused on teaching skills and concepts, and it's, it's a kind of classic game-based learning example because they had learning goals that they started out with, and then they designed the game around those learning goals. And it could also be used as a preparation for future learning experience if you, know, you put the game in a classroom context and have students play the game and then give students more practice at solving these linear equations. There is one critical thing that makes games effective for learning. And it's something that people tend to forget about when they start to incorporate games into learning experiences. And that is to make explicit connections between the game and whatever context or whatever situation that you want students to learn about. If we had students play Was It Trouble for five hours, and then we gave them a test on linear equations, they are not going to 
necessarily perform that well on the test. They actually might not even know that they've been solving linear equations yet. But if you have students play Was It Trouble and you talk explicitly about how the game is re-representing linear equation problems, then you've got a recipe for success. This has happened in some of the research on Dragon Box, for instance, where students, they've reached very, very high levels in solving algebra problems in Dragon Box, but then when you actually give them, say, a standard algebra test, they don't do any better than students who haven't played the game. Now, the problem is not that Dragon Box wasn't teaching them things, it's that the students didn't make the connection between the game experience and the problem solving, the actual algebra problem solving. The more that you bridge the game experience with experiences outside of the game or in other contexts, the more powerful that game is going to be for facilitating learning. If this has helped you understand how games impact learning, I would really appreciate it if you liked this video so that it could spread to other people. And if you have good game-based learning examples, leave one in the comments. I know that there are some really amazing learning games out there, and there are also some truly astonishingly terrible games out there as well. For more videos like this, well, you know what to do. Thanks everyone.